My name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is Wednesday, August 3rd, 2022, and I call this meeting to order. Just wanted to um, say that we were off last week. Uh, feels like an eternity, but um, we're back. A lot has happened. Um, most importantly, we have onboarded our compliance team. Oh, so we had over a hundred people apply for these positions. Um, and there was so many talented people that we had to turn down. Um, however, the good news is that um, the four that accepted plus carry really are the best of the best. Um, and they're gonna start doing site inspections um, later this week. Um, so I thought I would take a few minutes now to introduce them and allow everyone watching um, to really just kind of match a face with a name, because um, these people will be kind of contacting you about site visits. Carrie, I'd like to, if you're there, um, kind of turn things over to you to introduce the team. Um, but I did just want to very uh, publicly thank you for accepting this role. Um, you know, for 30 years, you were a pillar at Ag, the Agency of Agriculture, and I'm sure it wasn't easy saying goodbye to those folks. Um, but, you know, if we're going to get this right, if we're going to kind of honor Vermont's reputation for, for quality, you know, you're the right person for this job. So thank you, and I'll turn things over to you. Well, thank, thank you, James. Um, no, I really appreciate it. It's, it's, uh, it's been really fun thinking about how to operate in this space, what the market can look like. And um, bringing on the compliance team this week has me really excited. We've got a deep bench as far as uh, compliance goes. Um, a lot of experience either, either working in state systems um, and a lot of knowledge about cannabis as well. Um, uh, the first one I'd like to introduce is uh, Chipper Sullivan. He's in Brattleboro. Um, Chipper, if you can turn your camera on, that would be great. And this is Chipper Sullivan. He's down in Brattleboro. He's a long time um, farm, produce farm um, experience, as well as experience in one of the larger dispensaries, working in one, one of the larger dispensaries in, in Mass. And uh, welcome Chipper. He's located in Brattleboro and will likely be covering the lower half of the state. Uh, Chipper, if you wanna say hello, that would be great. Uh, hello, I am Chipper Sullivan. It's all true. It wasn't a dispensary as much as it was a tier 11 outdoor grow. Um, yeah, and my experience in Massachusetts left me with an undying dedication to do it right in Vermont because I have lots of criticisms of their system. So I'm looking forward to getting off the ground and getting things going here in Vermont. <laughs> Thanks, Chipper, and it's, I apologize. I did know it was a grow, so there's a lot of grow experience there. Um, and we're happy, really happy to have you on board uh, representing the Vermont uh, field on, uh, boots on the ground, the face of the control board out in the field. Um, yep, it's great to be next, here. Next, um, Next person I'd like to introduce is probably uh, a name that a lot of folks will recognize. She's been working in hemp space as well as teaching uh, the cannabis class at both VTC and Castleton. Um, Chris, you're up. This is Chris Monica. She's our next uh, compliance officer I'd like you folks to meet. Hi, um, I'm Super, super happy to be um, part of this effort um, and, and excited to start getting out there and, and meeting the, the license holders. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, it looks like I might head up towards the kingdom. Um, so anybody who's up that way should be seeing me soon um, and just happy to be on board and and moving forward with a great uh, industry. So. And um, anybody who started growing cannabis in Vermont in hemp space, 
um, we'll recognize the next individual, uh, Mike DiTomaso. He is currently at the Agency of Ag, but as the hemp program transitions over from the Agency of Ag, um, split between USDA and product um, regulation here at the control board, um, we'll all be familiar with, with Mike DiTomaso. Here's to that. Hey, I'm Mike DiTomaso, super excited to be here. As Carrie mentioned, I'm still with the Agency of Agriculture, but will be starting full-time for the board on August 15th. Um, so uh, as Carrie mentioned again, I've been working with hemp growers and processors in Vermont for the past um, four years or so, and I'm, I'm really excited to be carrying on, carrying on uh, that relationship with a lot of the folks that that will be um, also entering the, the cannabis space. Um, thanks, and look forward to, to meeting you out in the field. And, uh, our last uh, hire starting Monday. Um, she's really shined as someone who's going to help us navigate the state system. Um, experience at the department or agency of human services um, department of aging and independent living um, we've brought on denise mccarty and uh, i'm gonna have denise say hello Betty. Um, I'm Denise McCarty, and um, I'm really looking forward to doing this very important work. Um, so I will be seeing <laughs> many of you. Um, it looks like I'll be covering um, Washington, Lemorial, and Chittenden counties or so. Um, so I'll see you out there. Thank you so much. Take care. And that's that's uh, that's the team currently. Um, we will be starting field visits. They've been out this morning, but those are starting this week and into next week. Um, we'll see you all out there. Thank you. And thanks. Thanks, Gary. And thanks to everyone. Uh, really, I mean, it's uh, it's such an exciting time in Vermont, and it's, I'm just I couldn't be happier with the kind of everyone's enthusiasm to get going and, and really do this right here in Vermont. So thank you um, to everyone um, on the behind side. Super exciting. Very exciting, yeah. Um, just a quick update on licensing. Um, so it is April, or sorry, August 3rd. We don't have any product manufacturers ready to go for this week. Uh, we're still trying our best to make it through kind of our outdoors and cultivation licenses, but we are moving on to um, the product manufacturers and wholesalers. Um, so we should have some of those soon. Um, also, um, our application portal is ready for retail. Um, we decided to go ahead and open that. Um, so uh, if you are a prospective retailer, um, our portal is live. You can access it um, through our website at ccb.vermont.gov forms. And there's a link there to access our application portal and you'll see now that there is a way to apply for retail licenses so that's great um, we really want to kind of get those applications in and start their review um, as soon as we can um, with respect to outdoor cultivators i mentioned something at our last meeting that generated a few questions so i figured i'd just revisit it and see if i can clear up some of the confusion um, if you have a pending application for an outdoor or a mixed year cultivation license, the board emailed you a letter asking if you still want us to process your application this year. Um, we know that at this point in the summer, if you don't have your plants in vegetation or in the ground, um, you're probably not going to get a full harvest. Um, if you are in this situation and it doesn't look like you're going to plant or harvest this year, um, the board really doesn't want you to have to pay for a license that you're not going to get the full benefit of. We don't want you to have to pay for um, insurance or banking services that you're not, if you're not actually going to operate this year. Um, on the other hand, I'm sure there are people um, in this situation that do want their license. Um, you know, maybe you want to get your operation ready to go for the spring and you want to do that on your own timeline. So um, really us sending 
out this letter, did not suspend um, or pause our review of your application. You don't have to take any action if you want us to continue to process your application. But if you do want to pause, um, there are instructions in the letter on how to communicate that to the board. Um, we'll be in touch with you if you do communicate that to the board that you want to pause. And we'll be able to talk you through kind of what the next steps are and, you know, some of the things um, like banking and insurance requirements that you can kind of waive in this interim period. Um, just a general point also that um, email is always the best uh, and most efficient way to communicate with us. Our staff is very responsive over email and it's always the easiest way for us to provide clear answers to your questions. So please try to prioritize email when communicating with the board. It just speeds everything up on our ends. Uh, the medical program, um, we're in the process of developing our legislative proposals for the medical program. We wanted to start um, by asking the public to share their thoughts with us. Um, to that end, we're going to be holding two roundtable discussions next week, one on Wednesday, August 10th at 2 p.m. right after our board meeting, and then one the following day on Thursday, August 11th at 6 p.m. Um, we'll have some directed questions we'd like to ask the public, members of the public, but this will be an open-ended discussion about the future of the medical program. Um, so if you care about the medical program, if you're a current or former patient, um, if you're a caregiver, um, if you're a healthcare provider, uh, if you're someone who has not been able to access the medical program or it's been unaffordable, um, or if you just want to listen, please join those roundtables and share your thoughts with us. Um, these will be fully remote, and the links to participate will be um, either by phone or by, by video will be available on our website, and we'll get those up uh, as soon as we can. But they're next, next Wednesday and next Thursday. Um, the just wanted to talk quickly about the tobacco product tax, um, sometimes just referred to as the vape tax. I think it's clear at this point that um, despite whatever the legislative intent or the, the logic of this tax, um, it is going to apply to cannabis vaping devices and cannabis products, um, whether they have any tobacco in them or not. Uh, I want to be clear that, you know, everything that we've learned about Evoli um, you know, the CCB thinks that leaving this tax in place is dangerous, um, and we're going to ask the legislature to exempt THC products from um, this tax. However, until that happens, um, anyone who intends to retail these products will need to comply with the law, um, including getting a tobacco retailer license from the Department of Liquor and Lottery. The tax department has developed guidance on how to comply um, with the requirements of the tobacco uh, tax. Um, they, uh, they updated their kind of guidance document. It's on page eight. Um, and we have a link to it on our website and they, they have it posted on their website as well. Um, we've quick note on inventory tracking. Um, we've made significant progress on getting our inventory tracking system up and running. I want to wait um, just a little bit longer until we have contracts in place uh, before I go into the specifics. Um, but just the 30,000 foot view, um, licensees are going to have reporting requirements that they're going to submit to the board at regular intervals about their inventory. Um, and we will be analyzing those uh, that data, those data sets, um, with the help of a third party analytics contractor um, for aberrations and suspicious activity, and they're going to help prioritize our enforcement actions. So we'll have more on this um, very soon, um, but we're just kind of in the process of getting contracts signed. So um, other than that, just need to approve the minutes from our last meeting on July 20th. Um, do you guys have a chance to review those? Mm -hmm. yep. Is there a motion? <clears throat> Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So moving down the agenda, um, you know, we are required 
to develop a point of sale flyer um, with kind of information for consumers that gets handed out by retailers at the point of sale. Um, you know, not a lot of information can fit on just a little warning label. Um, and so this is a way to kind of provide additional information to consumers at the point of sale. Um, Julie took the lead on developing this. She had kind of a robust process of stakeholder input. Um, you have a draft of it? I do. And um, <clears throat> thought it might be helpful to kind of review that now. Sure. Um, just to do a little table setting reminder and um, leaping off from where you started, the requirement in the, uh, in the legislation is that the retailer is handed out um, or offer it at the point of sale. And then uh, we would have it posted on our website. And um, the legislature um, had some requirements for the content as well um, to include methods of consumption and the, the time it would take for a product to take effect where folks might seek help if they're having issues with um, substance misuse and so forth. So with that in mind, then the other um, key component is that they required that we consult with the Department of Health, which we did. Um, and so to keep in mind when I share the draft that the target audience for this flyer is essentially someone who has already gone into a cannabis establishment and is at the point of purchase um, and is perhaps someone who has not purchased cannabis before or is not a regular consumer. So it's got a lot of very basic information for that reason because our you know, guiding principles that, we, that led off from our mission um, were about consumer education and um, harm reduction. So that is really sort of the goal I took with this. Um, <clears throat> so we got input from um, the Department of Health. We did consult with them. I also consulted with a prevention community and our um, appointee on the advisory committee who is um, in the um, Agency of Health and Human Services. Um, so specifically sought out folks who have experience communicating um, public health information, um, harm reduction information and prevention and consumer uh, uh, education information. Um, and we also uh, got lots of public comments, particularly back um, during the period of time that we were doing the subcommittee meetings with the um, uh, public health subcommittee. There was conversation about this, so I went back to those conversations as well. And other states have similar things either on their websites or in their stores, so we looked at those as well. So with that, I will share the draft. Okay, so also just a reminder, this is the text only. So um, any sort of formatting or, um, you know, branding um, or logos that would be on it are not necessarily in here. I thought it was sort of important to get the text right first. Um, so it starts off talking about, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find the way to navigate here. Um, it starts off sort of discussing the difference between THC and CBD. Um, it seems like there is confusion among some of the broader community about what those two things are and what they do and, and their effects on the body. Then it goes into some of the legalities, um, 21 plus only, unless you have a medical marijuana card, um, no public use, prohibited on public lands. It talks about um, the dangers of driving under the influence. Um, which was one of the legislative requirements. How do I navigate down? There it is. There we go. I don't know how you edited the rules like this, David. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I struggle with this. Okay, um, so it talks about driving under the influence um, and the dangers there, again, legislative requirement. Um, and then one of the other legislative requirements is the, a, a notice that it is um, still federally illegal. So the what's bought in Vermont must remain in Vermont um, is geared towards that. And then from there, it really talks about safety um, and safe consumption. So uh, talking about everyone's experience being different starting low and going slow. Um, we got some feedback about being a little bit more specific about the type of dosage that someone should start with. 
Um, so we um, added that as well, and a little conversation about potency. There we go. You're going, you're starting, you're going slow. You That's know okay. Low, we're, going go, slow. we're starting low, we're going slow, we're going to go through. <laughs> um, so talking about potency, um, that potency matters, um, that certain products like edibles may take longer to take effect. And then you can see in each of these, it talks a little bit about like a starting dosage and a wait time before taking a longer dose um, for edibles, for vaping, for um, concentrates. Um, commonly known as dabs and for smokable flour. Um, then a little bit of a warning about um, not mixing cannabis with other substances, particularly if you're not a regular consumer. Um, and a notice that cannabis is not for everyone. There are some folks who have good experiences with cannabis and some folks don't. So here's where someone would find information um, if they're struggling, they are someone they know is struggling with um, an issue with misuse. And then also, um, if they are having uh, psychosis or suicidal thoughts, the uh, National Suicide Prevention Hotline is listed here as well. And then for signs of overuse, um, there's a little uh, sentence or two about that, but most importantly, the Poison Center, who I also um, spoke with about this, they asked us to put the number in the flyer, which we did, and they, they provided us with um, some logos to add when the time comes to do that. Um, but they also um, have experience speaking with people who have um, consumed too much and being able to guide them um, uh, and help them in the moment. Um, then there's a warning about what to do, um, sorry, cannabis and um, youth brain development, and that it's um, not suited for people under 21 um, and that the brain does not finish developing until 25. Um, so some of this information is added, not just because, I mean, I don't, there wouldn't be a youth in a retail location to receive this flyer, but this will likely go home with a product that perhaps their parent or guardian purchases, and these are things that they should be thinking about when they have cannabis in their home. Um, so then there's also information about accidental use um, to avoid while pregnant or caring for children and to keep uh, locked and out of sight and out of reach of children and how to do that. And that, um, and then some um, how to consume safely. Um, just a reminder for folks who might be using, uh, you know, or might be out doing recreational activities. If they don't consume cannabis, it may affect their response time. Um, and to be careful, actually, this sort of came from Colorado has a similar warning in their flyer, um, although there's a specific to skiing. Um, and then to consult a healthcare provider if you have questions. So that's the content, um, I can show the logos and so forth that are from like the Let's Talk Cannabis logo um, was provided to us by the Department of Health. The um, National or the uh, New England Poison Center logo was provided to us and some other prevention links um, that we can include in the, um, in the final version of the flyer. Thank you for taking the lead on this, Julie. Yeah, You're welcome. that's great. Yeah, no, I mean, um, when you think about the in intended audience, these are kind of the, the things that, these are the things I think people need to know. Um, so, yeah. And I think it's important to remember that the preface that you said at the beginning, these are folks that are at the point of sale, ready to, you know, do a transaction. Yeah. Um, and it's just helping for the folks that may be doing this their first time or first couple times and you know have no prior experience just the the things that they you know, should think about should it not be the experience that you know they may think it is right um one other thing i should mention too is that um this should be seen as kind of part of a, a multi-layered approach to harm reduction and consumer education because we also have required education for our retailers um, and other agencies and you know other entities also do consumer education. There will be responsible retailers that are doing or um, establishments that care a lot about educating the public as well. So this is really part of a multi-layered approach. Right. And also there's the investment 
of the excise tax yeah. towards your prevention and education right. as well. Yeah, no, I think this is great. I had just a few little, very small comments, but you know, I don't know if it makes sense to do them here or not, because um, they really are just kind of like little, like stylistic things. It almost makes sense. I feel like I'm mean, going to just send them to Bryn because they don't change the substance at all of okay. the document. Um, so I could do it that way instead of kind of editing it here. Um, but just from a process standpoint, you know, it seems like whatever kind of final draft that we come up with should just get one more review sure. by Department of Health, um, just get their final sign off on it. Because, I mean, you, you know, you, I'm, I don't feel qualified to kind of be the person to just say this is the right messaging or this is the right message. This is the right message. So, um, you know, we have to rely on their expertise. They've right. been doing this for years in, in other areas. So great. All right. Good. Um, let's move on then. Um, I know we got a comment last week um, about kind of doing another categorical exemption a few weeks ago, and I know you know I asked you to kind of think think it through whether it yeah. makes sense, and so maybe you could just help us uh, decide on that. Yeah. So. Folks that were with us two weeks ago may remember that we did a categorical waiver for the rubber or plastic gasket or seal that's often found in um, glass jars with a with a screw top, whether that screw top is tin or wood or bamboo. Um, at this time, we're not doing any categorical waivers for a plastic screw top. But what we we did get a comment we we did two weeks ago approve um, two different uh, rubber dropper tops for like tinctures and stuff like that. Um, point well taken in our comments that, you know, one thing we're not trying to do is play to specific brands. Um, at that point in time, we'd only gotten two um, waiver requests for those specific, that specific product. And the more we thought about it, you know, I think it does make sense to extend that categor categorical waiver to those rubber tops that you use as a tincture bottle because there just isn't a really good alternative to those. And again, we're not trying to play to specific brands and this plastic ban language um, that we've put into our rules does create some unique situations where, you know, we're trying to focus on the substance, not the specific brand, but the specific brand does have carry some weight into what we're doing. But, you know, there's not a lot. Of, it, these can be found in so many different places um, from so many different vendors that, you know, we think that, that it's the best course of action to take. Yeah, great. So I think the best, are you all right with that, Julie? Oh, yes. Yeah. That's okay. And that's all, like any rubber stopper top is categorically waived, right? Exactly. So I think it might make sense for us to put up a few examples on our product registration waiver um, requests. Kind of. Yeah, well, I'll work with Ellie on that. And there is those two that have been approved. Yeah. And we can, you know, I don't want to highlight specific brands, but we'll put a, maybe we can put a picture up or something so yeah. folks know exactly what we're talking about. Right. You know, I will say that I haven't gotten, um, I think we've only gotten one new request since we went in this direction yeah. two weeks ago, which is encouraging. We are still considering some of the waivers that have been submitted, but we really want to encourage glass with these specific tops. I think if we're thinking about, you know, we opened retail windows today, and if we're thinking about retail establishments that are going to take advantage of our take back and reuse programs, this is going to be the best way for them to create a sanitation plan and using these specific types of packaging to um, to really take full advantage of that. So that's where we're at right now. All right. Well, why don't we uh, move on then? Um, next on the agenda, review of staff recommendations for social equity status and license applications. <laughs> Here we have your adult use and medical register for this week. Um, there are a couple things that look a little bit different about, um, about this register. So it should be pretty easy to navigate though. And I'll, I'll point out any, anything that needs to be clarified. So starting out with the medical cannabis program, um, some numbers from the last two weeks, um, 35 new patient applications, uh, 98 renewal applications received, 181 patient cards were issued, 
Um, eight caregiver applications were received and four renewals were received and seven were approved. Seven applications for caregivers were approved and 22 dispensary employee ID cards were issued. And an update, the medical staff are um, processing applications received on and after July 12th. Um, we have a final report on our uh, pre-qualification approvals um, that just breaks it down by the application type. So you can see in total, we issued 222 pre-qualifications. Um, no new ones. Uh, just a reminder, the pre-qualification window has closed for now. Um, but this is what our breakdown looks like for pre-qualification. Um, so I know you've seen these numbers before, but it's just a little bit more distilled um, to get a sense of what's coming. So I'll move on to our license applications. Um, this, these numbers are up to date as of yesterday. Um, you'll see in our table here, um, we have a new row here for employee ID cards. Um, that will probably be a separate table next time, um, but you can see we've got um, 37 employee ID card applications in the in process right now. Um, none have been issued as of yet, um, but a reminder that you are able to get a, a temporary employee ID card until your permanent um, application has been processed. So we'll break that out for next week. Um, this week we have, you can't really fit it all on the screen, but we've got um, 20 applications up for board approval for a license this week. Um, they are all cultivation applications still. Um, as the chair mentioned at the outset, we don't have any um, manufacturing or wholesaler applications up for a license just yet, but they are in review um, and hopefully soon we will have some ready for licensure. So I'll move down to our list for recommendations for a license. Um, the 20 businesses that um, staff are recommending for a license have all demonstrated compliance with the requirements set out in board rule and in statute. Um, so I'll just go through the list. We've got Burning Bush Farm, um, an outdoor tier one cultivator, Island Pond Cannabis Company, a mixed tier one cultivator, Flavor Line Cannabis Company, a mixed tier one cultivator. Trombley House of Cannabis, a mixed tier one cultivator. Seven Bees Farm, a mixed tier one small cultivator. Z's Green Z, a mixed tier one small cultivator. Hidden Valley Farm, a mixed tier one small cultivator. Uh, Dalen LTD, a mixed tier one cultivator. Overton's View Farm, Mixed Tier One Cultivator, Maple Buckets, LLC, um, Outdoor Tier Three Cultivator, Lagamont Breeds, LLC, Mixed Tier One Cultivator, Fox and Hen Farms, Outdoor Tier One Cultivator, Moonlit Gardens, an Outdoor Tier One Cultivator, Vermont Green Buds, LLC, Outdoor Tier One Cultivator, Green Mountain Gold Farm, Outdoor Tier One Cultivator, Cannabis Collective, Outdoor Tier 2 Cultivator, Faustini Farms, uh, a Mixed Tier 2 Cultivator, Love Spun Farmstead, an Outdoor Tier 1 Cultivator, Orleans Cannabis, a Mixed Tier 1 Cultivator, and Honey Tree Farm, a Mixed Tier 1 Cultivator. Um, so that is your list up for approval this week. I'll move on to social equity numbers for this week. Um, we have, um, we don't have any, uh, social equity applicants that are up for approval, um, for a license this week, but we do have six, uh, applicants who are up for, uh, social equity status this week. Um, and those are submission 529, um, staff are recommending social equity app, uh, status for this applicant because they meet the criteria for a social equity business applicant. Submission 191 also meets the criteria for social equity business applicant. Submission 286 meets the criteria for social equity business applicant. Submission 846 uh, meets the criteria for social equity individual applicant. Submission 852 meets the criteria for social equity individual applicant. 
and uh, submission 1000 um, meets the criteria for a social equity business applicant. Um, so staff is recommending that the board grant social equity status to those six submission numbers. Um, the staff is recommending social equity status denial for two submission numbers, um, and that's submission 380 and 695. Neither of these submissions um, meet the criteria for social equity individual applicant as defined in board rule. <clears throat> Any questions for Bryn? Nope. All right, is there a motion to approve the staff recommendations? I move that the board accept each of the recommendations for social equity status and licensing approval as presented to us by staff in this meeting. I will second. Any discussion about any of these? No? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Um, you know, one thing uh, that I haven't mentioned, but most people probably know, is that we have all of our approved licenses. Um, you can kind of see them by category up on our website. We also have a nice map feature. Um, you know, we don't list the specific address of these cultivation sites, but you can see just what towns they're in. So it's actually a very good geographic distribution of the ones we've licensed so far. It's, it's also four corners of the state. Yeah. Um, all right, so why don't we move to public comment? Um, you've shown by the link to make a comment. Please raise your virtual hands. Um, we'll start with the, those um, kind of in the order that you've raised your hand, and then we'll move to anyone who's joined by a phone. Um, and maybe, Nelly, you could help us out with the order. Absolutely. Dave is first. Hey all, um, I, I wanna share, first of all, thank you for the actions today. Uh, great information, good progress. Um, very happy to see things, uh, the, the retail application open, but I wanna share a frustration uh, that I'm getting uh, from many of my clients uh, regarding uh, the CSI background check process. Um, I mean, I know that you guys would prefer to do it a different way and it was foisted on you because the FBI rejected you. And so, you know, um, I think everyone gets that. Um, but the CSI process, aside from being expensive, is, is occasionally very slow. Um, and by the way, the results I'm seeing are, are sometimes not great. Like I've had a couple of clients who I know have criminal records because we pulled it for the prequal from the FBI background check and CSI isn't even getting it. They're, they're missing it. Um, so, you know, I think you're getting poor service levels from CSI in addition to the high cost and the frustrating uh, process. But I think even more importantly, it is a drag on the application process. Um, currently, um, people are not being asked to start the CSI process until after some level of deep staff review. And I'm wondering whether there is any way for you guys to get people to start the CSI process even earlier, like when the pro when their application goes from submitted to received. Uh, because at least then they can, they can get that started. And if CSI is taking one, two, three, four weeks sometimes when it's complicated, at least you already have that back by the time the staff is doing the deep review and moves the application from received to either incomplete or whatever, that they have the background check so that there's not a two week pause or, or several week pause while waiting for CSI. Um, so that's my suggestion to you in this uh, CSI process that I know everyone I'm looking at on the screen here is frustrated by. So thank you. Thanks, Steve. Marie. Marie with Marie. Bro. Marie, we can't hear you. Can, can you guys hear me yet? Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, okay, sorry, it was taking forever to unmute. <laughs> um, no thank you again, as always, for what you do and how hard I'm sure you're all working because I know it's gotta be a very difficult process. Um, but I have to echo what David just said. I'm in, um, in, the, in the process of, I have submitted my application for manufacturing tier two, 
And what really worries me is the time frame, the crunch I'm going to be under because I can't legally like go and purchase these products that I need to purchase to make my pre-rolls um, without the licensing through some organizations that I'm working with, the companies I'm working with want to see my license. And my biggest concern is, and I know this, you know, I, I, I guess I just need to let you know what, what I'm dealing with is the time frame of when I get these products, if we're talking weeks for the CSI, we're talking weeks for me to be able to get my products to make, um, you know, the, the product that I'm going to produce, then yeah, we're looking at like past the going live date. And that really worries me because I, I want to be in on it. So just wanted to throw that out there. It's kind of scary. We're getting into crunch time, you know, from our perspective. So just wanted to share that. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Marie. Appreciate the comment. Kate. Hi, uh, this is Kate Burke from Grabelle and Shea. Um, I just said what I think is probably a pretty simple technical question. The application website is not the best. It, it um, tends to boot us out each time we log out. We have to reset passwords. I was just wondering for purposes of expediting you know, uh, collect information for the application. I definitely understand and agree with you guys wanting the application submitted through the portal, but could you post a PDF of the application too so people could just look at it with the understanding it has to be submitted through the portal, but so we could gather the info without fighting the website so much? Thanks for the comment, Kate. Just so, just so folks know, we don't generally answer questions directly during the, the public comment period. It would very quickly turn into kind of a just question and answer session. Um, but we do collect these comments. We do consider them and we do try and um, post comments uh, or post guidance or uh, around this or just come back with an update at the next meeting as to some of the kind of suggestions or questions that we've received. Tito. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you're all having a great day. Um, uh, I want to second what Kate was saying. We just we had a technical problem over here to um, the new link on the retail app just as access denied when we tried. Uh, um, next, I just want to talk about the, the disclosure of locations of licensees um, on the website. I I really, I just don't see an upside to that, and it's really concerning. And and I hope that that goes away. Um, I think most, uh, you know, obviously retailers want want people to know where they're at, but um, I think I can I can safely speak for most growers that they they definitely don't want people knowing where they are, and there's no reason for it. Um, you know, the downsides are are plenty, so I, I'd really like to see that go away. Uh, and lastly, um, that vape tax news. Um, I'm I'm glad to hear that. That you're that the CCB is taking some action, um, but I'm I'm it's really disappointing um, to hear, and also doesn't really make sense that they're going to keep this for cannabis, yet the current dispensaries don't pay this tax now. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so uh, hopefully we can navigate through through that issue. But that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Tito. Michael is next. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for all the hard work that you guys have all been putting into this uh, new industry. Um, I work for an insurance agency out of Massachusetts and have firsthand seen the difficulties of our own state. Um, and I've been working pretty diligently with uh, a number of applicants in Vermont as well. Um, and one thing I wanted to comment on was the insurance requirements for uh, Vermont operators, more specifically for uh, home-based businesses. Um, I actually have an exclusion up from one of the largest insurance providers for home insurance in Vermont uh, that states uh, no coverage is provided for bodily injury or property damage arising out of a business owned or financially controlled by the insured or a partnership of which the insured is a partner or member. Therefore, home insurance is not covering home based businesses, whether it be a cultivation or product manufacturing operation. Uh, we are actively developing a new program that is a commercial insurance uh, option for these new home-based businesses that does not have a residential exclusion. Uh, this should be online soon. 
Um, like I said, we've seen some pretty hard difficulties here in Massachusetts regarding insurance. Um, I'd like to work with the, the board here on the insurance requirements to make the process a little bit more streamlined for these new home-based businesses, as well as the commercially located businesses as well. Um, and from a risk management standpoint, I have to back what this the last speaker just said about the locations of these operators. Um, it does enforce a, a level of theft that could be concerning to insurance carriers getting into this new market. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for your time and uh, thank you for your hard work and looking forward to more developments within the industry here soon. Thank you. Nate. Thanks everyone for taking um, all these public comments and for your time building this out. Uh, it's uh, much appreciated. I just wanted to ask with the um, moved up schedule to accept retail applications, if that also comes with uh, any sort of moved up deadline um, to get those in. I didn't hear you reference anything like that. I just want to make absolutely sure that that uh, wasn't uh, you know a stipulation or a contingency with moving up the uh, the date to start accepting them, that you're moving up at some sort of date to stop accepting them. Um, so that's all I had. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. Bobby. Hi, thank you for taking my question and comments and appreciate all the work you guys have done. Um, I am a social equity applicant and I've been scrambling to get everything resubmitted. Um, I did it last week. Uh, I, I sent an email. I sent three emails, one voicemail. I tried on the portal. My issue is the portal, application intake portal, it's it's very complicated. It's, it shouldn't be complicated. There's a glitch somewhere. But I tried to resubmit, went back and looked through the work, review. Having said all that, I sent everything via email to make sure you got my information. But I haven't had any responses and the, the past week. And so Monday, brilliantly, it, it I resubmitted and it took it. So I don't really know where my application is at this process, but it's been a long journey and I feel like I need to create a support group for this process. <laughs> I'm sure you need to, you feel like too. It's a lot of work for everybody. Thank you for getting us this far, but I still don't have any information, even though I was issued a license on the 17th. So I went back and did everything you asked is there any way I can find out where my application is at this point? Maybe a, a sidebar note. Is there anything else you need from me at this point? Um, and I can, my application number is the S and the 60718. And my second Sorry. question. Sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. My second question is, are uh, cultivators also required to have a retail license for tobacco? for the taxes as cultivators? So Bobby, we don't, again, just generally answer questions directly during this, this public comment period, um, but we will have someone reach out to you about your application. And then the tax department is the one and liquor control that can answer questions about what's required um, from a tax compliance standpoint. All right, I'll follow up with that. Thank you for reviewing my um, application again to make sure if I, there's anything missing. Thanks, Bobby. And thank you for all your work. Jim. Thank you. Um, I really want to thank Ms. Hubbard for her openness and for reaching out and drafting the point of sale flyer, uh, we really appreciate that. And we think you're making great progress. Um, I'd like to ask that you post the draft that you discussed today on your website so we can all see the draft. And um, second, I'm hoping at some point the, the board will put on this agenda the proposed amendment to Rule 2.9 that we submitted on June, July 8th. And just to refresh your recollection, under Connecticut's approach, um, the state requires retailers to make best efforts to market low potency, low dose items. And we'd like to suggest nine be amended to include that mandate in Vermont. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Al. 
Um, yeah, I have a quick comment. Um, I just want to echo what I think it was Tito was the name uh, in terms of the location of cultivation spaces or facilities not being public record or at least easily accessible. Um, that seems like an enormous, enormous issue to me. And I would definitely encourage you to take that really seriously. And, um, you know, bear in mind that the reason, you know, to me, that's so important. It's not, you know, a couple of teenagers that are going to come, you know, try to snag a plant. Um, you know, if you follow any of what happens out West, it's a level of organization that's going to come and make sure they get all your your plans in the best case scenario. Um, so I would definitely implore you to do a little bit of research on what has happened in certain parts of California, specifically with the cartel targeting legal licensed grow operations. I don't think we experience the same level of organized crime in Vermont as somewhere like California with the cartel, but especially as one of the states that is um, legal with other states around it not being legal, it just seems like a total no-brainer to me. Thanks, Al. Jesse Lynn. so much for having me. Um, my name is Jessie Lynn Dolan. I'm a nurse and I don't get to attend these meetings very often, unfortunately, lately. So I want to just jump in and throw in a couple comments related to some of the things discussed today. When we talk about packaging, I will just continue to mention that I would love us to address and look at using different and more accepting inclusive language than breastfeeding, because that is um, the theme and the norm today to use more inclusive language when we're looking at that population. I wanted to ask if there's any information you guys can share along the lines of education and when or what you will be mandating and what that's going to look like for employees. Um, I want to reiterate my support of Tito and reducing the taxation on vapes and just let you guys know as a cannabis control board, if you have not seen the new research, there is new research out showing even more detrimental effects just on the temperature that vapes are um, are combusting at. So looking at that and again, deterring people from using those single use cartridges instead being able to purchase flower vaporizers without that in increased taxation. I also wanna reiterate as a single female cannabis cultivator, it is very concerning for me to have my address publicly out there. It has brought concerns and issues to me before, and I know this has been brought up, but I will continue to support the other folks who are asking to look at possibly adjusting or looking you know, for more safety parameters around that. Last one or two things I just want to mention, because I know it hasn't, I don't think it's been talked about in a little bit, is some of the lab testing mandates. I will continue to mention and advocate for mandated terpene testing in our labs, because if we really are concerned about intoxication and the way cannabis affects us from, from that psychoactive perspective, we do need to be looking at the terpene testing. And if we want to support both patients and consumers to use both uh, efficaciously and affordably, then terpene testing is where that education will support them. And lastly, just wanted to throw out there, and I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff out you, but you guys know me by now, it's kind of how I roll. Um, <laughs> wanted to mention third-party certifications and programs like Clean Green and what that means and can mean to Vermont and where that falls along pesticide testing and also the use of the word organic. We're seeing a lot of people out there posting things saying they're organic and I know the USDA has different opinions and thoughts on the use of that word. So I just wanted to see if and when we'd have some guidance regarding both that and education. So thank you so much for everything. Thanks, Jesse Lynn. Thanks, Jesse Lynn. So I don't see any other hands up. I'll move to folks that join via the phone. Um, if you'd like, if you join by the phone and would like to make a public comment, you can unmute your phone by hitting star six. And of course, if you join by the link, just continue to, and you want to make a comment, please feel free to just raise your hand. Uh, we generally don't take repeat 
comments during these formats. Um, but if you have a comment um, that you'd like to make, you know, we have on our website just a, a portal where you can just kind of click on that button, submit a comment. The it goes to every board member's inbox, so we, we will see it. Um, okay. And you know, we will and have another. Actually, public just comment. wondering. It's actually not a comment. I'm wondering if that insurance man is still on because I've been having a heck of a time finding insurance. So I would appreciate if he's still there, if I could get his name again. Um, well, remember the name. Our, our website, I mean, the, the video to this meeting will be posted on both YouTube and our website, linked on our website. So you, you can just kind of go back and watch it. And we do have a few insurance companies that have uh, kind of reached out to us. It's not an endorsement of any of them, but have reached out to us and say, we do insure cannabis businesses on our website. If there aren't any Thank other pu public comments, um, then I'll close the public comment window. Um, Thank you for the for the comments. Thank you for the concerns. Again, we, we try not to answer questions directly during these uh, public comment sessions, but we do really appreciate the feedback and we are constantly updating our processes, updating our guidance based upon what we're hearing from people kind of on the ground. So thank you for that. Just on the location of cultivators, I did want to touch on that. We are not posting physical addresses, span numbers, we're not posting any of that. We're posting just the town. Um, and we have a kind of balancing act that we have to do with respect to the public records laws. And we're allowed to exempt, um, you know, anything that might implicate public safety. Uh, we decided that the line there is the actual address, um, not the town. Um, but we can always reconsider internally whether or not we need to be even more general with the information that we put out. Um, but um, the, it's a point that we have thought about um, and discussed here, and we can kind of continue to discuss. Uh, yeah, I think folks need to remember that these are public records. And yes, we are aware of what goes on in other states. But thank you. Um, any other uh, comments from... Julie, Kyle, Bryn, David, that we need to make before we adjourn? Um, unless you have an objection, I'm comfortable adding chest feeding and human milk feeding to the flyer. I did a little research. I meant to mention this when I was talking about it, but I saw it, um, I saw it on your text at your flyer. Yeah. So I, I, I think we are going to add that okay. if it's not already there. Sure. I may have added it already. So, uh, but yeah, through. so midwives are using that language and um, a couple of state departments of health in other states. Great. <clears throat> right. Um, if there's nothing else, I'll adjourn this meeting. We'll see everyone next week.